I thought uh, I would share with you today, um, my lab uh, has two components which are really one component at the end of the day. So some of our studies are on fundamental mechanisms of learning and memory. Recently, we have looked at memory allocation, for example, uh, the, a property that decides what neurons are engaged, which synapses are engaged in a given memory, what are the rules by which neurons and synapses are committed to a given memory. But uh, we also work, as Jackie indicated, on mechanisms that are underlying neurodevelopmental disorders. And uh, what I thought I would do today, because I know that you know, the unique interest of this institution in autism, what I thought I would do today is to share with you a story that's very dear to my heart, actually, and one that I think whose journey um, would be useful in illuminating some of the challenges that Tara had in, in autism. So um, what, do, what do I mean by this? Uh, one of the fundamental problems that, have, that all of us face in studying neurodevelopmental disorders is when do we intervene? When is it too late if there is such a thing? So uh, there's a lot of data that shows that for intellectual disability, for schizophrenia, for autism, that by the time you get to this stage here, there's a lot of key events that are essentially ongoing and that may be leaving behind biological changes that will last for the life of the individual. So by the time you get here, maybe is it too late? Essentially, that's a question that we have to wrestle with because at the end of the day, there are you know, many millions of patients uh, that will go on leading lives that are uh, far from optimal if we can help them, right? So at one level, we need to figure out what goes on here so we can prevent deficits, but then we need to figure out at this stage, what can we do? And in this respect, something fundamentally has changed. And uh, what we now know is that at least in studies in animal models, we know that we can intervene as late as adult stages and still have an impact. This is something that we're still struggling to understand but there's been so many studies now that I think we can comfortably say that this idea is worth you know, considering and, and, and pursuing. And part of this is that mutations such as rosopathy mutations, which impact on learning and memory, on intellectual disability, have well-known problems in neurodevelopment. So these mutations cause problems in neurodevelopment. But they also, in addition to these problems, cause problems in mechanisms of adult function, adult cognitive function, in this case, adult learning and memory, uh, resulting in intellectual disability, resulting in autism, and uh, other comorbidities that we see in rosopathies in general. So you have uh, deficits in development, and then you have deficits in adult mechanisms. And what's really counterintuitive, but really wonderful, is that uh, at least in animal models, if you treat either of these two problems, if you treat either development, or if you treat these adult mechanistic deficits, that you can get unexpected benefits in function. Actually, the studies in mice, and there's dozens of these studies now, show that if you intervene in the adult and rescue the deficient biochemistry, rescue the deficient physiology, you can restore, in many cases, what appears to be intact adult function. Now, will this be the same in human subjects? Probably not, because a mouse sits in a cage, a human sits in a rich environment where every day there is something to be learned. So if you intervene when you are 17, 18, 20, 10, 11, 12, you know, there are decades that you have lost, that you need to catch up. And then, you know, the human brain has windows where we are optimally uh, optimize for the learning and developing. So if you try to catch up much later, then you have that handicap you know, you know, to deal with. But nevertheless, I think what we have learned from animal models is that there is a great deal of, uh, of, uh, uh, of plasticity in the adult brain, that if we only correct the abnormal biochemistry, the abnormal uh, 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 physiology, that we may be able to get uh, uh, recover in ways that we never imagined, let's say, 10, uh, 10, 20 years ago. The other key point that I would like to make, which is really important as we face 
complex disorders such as autism, for example, where it's not one gene, it's not one system even in the brain, but it's multiple genes, multiple systems, is that phenotypically similar and cognitively similar disorders can be caused by very different mechanisms. And this is really quite interesting. And I thought it would be uh, worthwhile to describe in detail a few cases that we actually know from a mechanistic you know, perspective. So what I decided to do in this, in this lecture is to focus on two disorders, both of which are Mendelian disorders. So in this case, we know the gene. They're not complex disorders like depression, schizophrenia, autism, where there are many genes, most of which we don't even know, but two disorders that we know the gene, two disorders for which we have mechanism. So we actually understand at the molecular and cellular level what's going on, and then see and learn from it, because as my good friend Tom Ensel has said many times, is before we can run, and what he means by running, is meaning tackling disorders such as autism, we have to be able to walk. And by walk, he meant being able to tackle single Mendelian disorders. So if we can understand the complex problem of going from animal model to experimental trials, to clinical trials, and to treatments that help the life of the patients that we all want to help, perhaps one strategy is to figure this process out, which we haven't figured it out yet. This is a process that we simply have not figured out yet. To figure out this process in very simple disorders so we can tackle more complex disorders. So it's in that spirit that I decided you know, today, instead of showing you and sharing you some of our autism work, which I don't think is nearly as interesting as the work that I'm about to share with you, because the work I'm about to share with you is far more mature. We have taken it from animal models all the way to clinical trials. And I thought that that kind of perspective may be more instructive than sharing with you uh, some of our more recent autism work. So what we have shown with NF1 is that uh, uh, this mutation, this, this Mendelian mutation, leads to increases in Rosmap kinase, increase in GABA release during learning, deficits in synaptic plasticity, long-term potentiation, and deficits in learning. Uh, in, in unpublished studies, so this is published, I will just summarize that data relatively quickly. In unpublished studies, we have uh, shown that in Noonan syndrome, at one time, Noonan syndrome and NF1 were so similar that they, they were part of one condition, right? So uh, if you think about autism, they will definitely be under the same diagnostic you know, you know, category umbrella, all right? So in this case, in Noonan syndrome, there's again more Rosmap kinase signaling too. There's, Deficits in learning, even deficits in synaptic plasticity. But when you look at the exact mechanism, in one case, you have an increase in GABA release. In the other case, you have an increase in AMPA receptor function at basal levels, at baseline, that precludes plasticity and learning. So in one case, there's too much inhibition, which precludes plasticity. In the other case, you have enhanced excitatory function at basal levels that precludes then changes in AMPA receptor function that leads to, uh, to, that are required for learning and memory. So very different phenotypes at this end and the, at the molecular end, but very different mechanisms in the end. So why is this important? Because as we develop therapies, we need to keep this in mind because the treatments will have to be mindful of this. I think uh, as we get ready to tackle far more complex conditions like autism, I think understanding these subtleties from single genetic disorders will be important, and how, how they affect and treatment and so on and so forth. So um, essentially what I'm gonna share with you is that both of these disorders which affect ROS signaling, one seems to have a critical role in inhibitory neurons, and the other one seems to have a critical role in excitatory neurons. In NF1, we have actually designed mice with the lesions of NF1 that are specific to inhibitory neurons, excitatory neurons, or astrocytes. And what we found is that we could only recap these interesting phenotypes in plasticity and learning when we deleted this disorder from inhibitory neurons, but not from excitatory neurons. Okay, so in the lab, the strategy that we have taken is to find a group of single Mendelian disorders that's related by a, a common pathway and study them. And, and today, instead of recapping all of this work, we will uh, you know, talk about first a summary of NF1, mostly data that has been published, so I will just show you some summary figures. And then in the second part of the talk, 
I will show you some real data from Noonan syndrome, all work that's not published. So first NF1 and then, and then Noonan. So how did this start it? This started actually, my uh, engagement with this story started when I was a graduate student. This gene was cloned in the very lab that I worked as a graduate student. I wish I could sit here and say that I had something to do with the cloning of this gene, but I didn't. I, you know, the only thing I did was to literally burn a bench when the cloning was announced. You know, <laughs> there was all of this excitement in the conference room, and I heard it, and I went to the conference room. I was doing a, a bacterial you know, streaking, and somehow the Bunsen burner turned and burned the bench. So my contribution to NF1 was burning a bench. But uh, you know, uh, back then, it was not even understood that NF1 patients had cognitive deficits. It's really amazing. If you ask patients now, families, they will tell you that the number one concern that they have are actually cognitive problems and social problems. Now we know that NF1, 20% of all NF1 kids have autism. We have known this for long, now we know it, right? So the social problems, the autism, and uh, the cognitive problems are foremost in people's minds. But back then, we didn't know. But we did have the gene. Uh, uh, a colleague of mine, there was a clinician, uh, this was when I was a graduate student, said, you know, when you have your own lab, remember, NF1 patients have cognitive problems, because I would go around advertising that I would study learning and memory <laughs> in my own lab. And he, he told me that, you know, remember this. And I remembered it. So uh, we looked at animal models of NF1. Then we looked at mechanisms, and we have uh, uh, devised treatments, which are now in, in clinical trials, and I'll summarize of you some of that. So NF1 is a dominant inherited condition. It affects about one in three to 4,000 people. This is not unlike many other uh, of this class of, 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 of conditions. NF1 gene encodes a RAS gap. It essentially accelerates the inactivation of RAS. So if you have not enough NF1, you have too much RAS active. It's a complex condition, like most of these Mendelian conditions are. It's not just about cognitive function, of course. Initially, NF1 was studied because of cancer tumors that these patients have. NF1's affects cognitive function, but these effects are complex, executive function, attention, spatial skills, language skills. It's a number of things, and the severity of each of these things changes from patient to patient. It's a complex landscape. It's not a simple, but then I don't have to tell this audience about that. Um, so what we decided to do is to focus on two uh, types of cognitive function that we could model effectively in mice. And I will share with you very briefly those results. Again, all of this is published. Let me start by uh, spatial function. So it's interesting, we have now run a couple of, of, of clinical trials around the world, and uh, what we have learned from experience is that if the parent has an F1 too, we need to go and wait for them in the parking lot because they will never get on time to the clinic. It, 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 so they're very pervasive. These spatial skills have actually been tested with virtual, war, you know, with virtual uh, spatial tasks, and they've been shown to, you know, to be quite clear in, in this patient population. So we decided you know, to look at hippocampal function, and uh, what we found was that indeed you know, there was enhanced RASMAP kinase signaling in inhibitory neurons uh, in, the, in the hippocampus. When we look at other cell types, we see some signal there, but it's not nearly as profound as in, in inhibitory neurons. It seems that there are other gaps which are active in other cell types and compensate for the loss, the partial loss of NF1. But in inhibitory neurons, this is a clear problem. Um, we also show enhanced GABA release, so excitatory function is normal. When we look at excitatory function, is normal, but when we look at GABA function, there is definitely enhanced GABA release during learning, which leads to impairments in long-term potentiation and hippocampal learning deficits. Now, how do we know that this causal chain is valid? How do we know that this is not just a list of phenotypes that are really unrelated? The reason we know is because we have been able to intervene at each of these stages and have been able to reverse all the downstream phenotypes. So that's how we know. I mean, the, the, the idea is that if you can't treat something, you have some insight over it. And that's uh, what we have done with NF1. We have also looked in prefrontal cortical function, and uh, we, and we uh, show that indeed in the prefrontal cortex there is enhanced RASMAP kinase signaling in inhibitory neurons, just like in the hippocampus, enhanced GABA release in prefrontal cortical circuits, 
just like in, in the hippocampus. By the way, we have also shown this in the striatum, because as, as you know, there is a close interaction between prefrontal and striatal circuits during working memory. So in both places, recordings show that there is enhanced GABA release. So we have that same phenotype in three brain regions. And I just came from a meeting where someone recorded in the amygdala another lab, and they found the exact same thing, that there is also enhanced GABA release, which leads to deficits in, in plasticity. And this work is about to come out. So, um, and, uh, so we did some modeling that showed that this amount of GABA release enhancement would lead to hypoactivation of the prefrontal cortex, which we only saw indirectly in the mouse, and to working memory and attentional deficits. So again, in both regions, the hippocampus and, and the prefrontal cortex, very similar mechanisms at play, but with very different consequences. In one case, a classical spatial learning problem, which by the way, recently we have done studies with patients and have shown that uh, a task like a word list task, which is a very uh, typical uh, uh, declarative memory task, we have, you have to remember word lists, these patients are uh, clearly impaired in them in this task. And working memory, as I will show you, is also clearly impaired in this, in this patient. So we have done our studies in mice, have led to studies in humans that I'm gonna briefly talk about that we have done. So the key question that we had once we were done with all these mouse studies is whether this biology was relevant to the biology of the disorder in humans. Because if it's not relevant, well, it's still interesting from a basic science perspective, but it's not gonna help us to understand human cognition, it's not gonna help us more importantly to try to find a way to help these patients. So that's what we decided you know, to do next. And I'll tell you what we have done and what other groups have done because we have not been alone on this. So what we have done is to start by looking and asking, is working memory really impaired in these patients? So it's impaired in mice. We had hints that executive function problems, organizing the world around you, organizing complex responses you know, to the world around you. Uh, were impaired in these patients, but we didn't have any formal proof that we could point to. So we paired up with another group at UCLA, Ty Cannon's group, we shared students, and what we have done is to look at working memory in this patient population, very standard Sternberg tasks of working memory, where you ask the, the subjects to hold, uh, uh, f uh, focus on, on a little screen, and then there are some syllables, you have to remember them and say if they are the same or different, very standard Sternberg-like working memory tasks, a variety of different versions of them, and the result was the same, uh, and that is that there are deficits in this population. So if you use other working memory tests, like for example, this task whose name I forgot now, uh, that you have to you know, remember letters and, <laughs> yes, you study what you don't have. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Uh, so, so where, you, uh, uh, where you have to remember uh, uh, letters and, uh, and numbers and you have to order them, it's, it's, it's a very uh, you know, standard task, again, of, of working memory. And once again, these patients were quite uh, impaired on them. And the treatment that I'll tell you about in a second reverses these deficits, which, which is really quite interesting in both mice and patients. So let me go on. So we did functional imaging. Why did we do functional imaging? Because remember what the deficit is. The deficit is an enhancement in GABA release, which we have documented in the hippocampus, in the prefrontal cortex, in the striatum, and another group has documented in the amygdala, right? So it seems that there is this enhancement in GABA release in multiple areas of the brain. And we wanted to ask, can we indirectly look at this? And so the first thing that we did was simply look at functional imaging. Why? Because for each inhibitory neuron, you have four to five to six excitatory neurons. But if you have an enhancement in inhibition, you have a decrease in excitatory function that we could measure with bold signal. Right? Because if you are a, on a working memory task, for example, you're engaging your dorsolateral you know, prefrontal cortex, then what we imagine is that you have too much inhibition. How did we imagine that? Because that's what we found in mice. And then we will see activation of these neurons, suppression of the response from excitatory neurons, and therefore a decrease in the size of the bold signal because you have less oxygen needed. That's what we expected and amazing because this doesn't happen very often. Amazing, we're actually right. And uh, uh, what Kerry Shiliansky in my lab, you know, together with, with Kerry Bearden uh, and, uh, uh, and Ty Cannon showed is that actually the degree of activation of the right dorsal 
lateral prefrontal cortex, which is well known to be involved and required for working memory, can predict the extent of deficit in these patients, which is really cool. So, you know, by looking at how hypoactivated the, the, you know, the prefrontal was, we can predict the extent of working memory deficit in these patients, which is completely consistent with inhibition. Then Miguel Castelo Branco in Portugal, a fellow Portuguese, um, he actually did spectroscopy and looked at GABA. And the idea was to look at vesicular, as you, I don't know if, if any of you are experts on this area, but the, you know, the idea is that when you look for GABA, you're looking for vesicular GABA. And the idea is if there's too much GABA release ongoing in the brain, maybe the levels of vesicular GABA should be lower because there's less in vesicles because more is being released. And essentially, that's what Miguel Castelo Branco found. And I'll show you some other results that were consistent with our data in, in just a second. Uh, we also were interested in terms of signaling. Can we find evidence that the prominence of NF1 in RAS signaling and the involvement and importance on the, on the physiological deficit I talked about is the same in humans? But of course, we cannot go into the brain and, and sample you know, human subjects for obvious reasons. So the best thing that we could think of is to look at blood levels of ROSMAP kinase, Y blood levels, because the idea is that this ROS signaling pathway is highly conserved in evolution. You see it in East, right? So we thought that it, maybe some of the modifiers of function would be common between blood and brain, and perhaps we could see some relationship, in, you know, between the two, and how would we do that by looking at cognitive markers and see if we could predict the extent of cognitive deficit by looking at the extent of, of biochemical deficit. But again, in blood, right? And the amazing thing is that in multiple measures, we saw a beautiful correlation, you know, between the hyperactivation of the ROSMAP kinase pathway due to the loss of NF1, which turns it down normally, and the level of cognitive deficit that we found in these patients. So now we had parallels at the systems level and at a molecular level. And I'll show you uh, just a bit more parallels at the other levels. And you may ask, why is that, are these parallels important? The reason is because I was just talking with Randy and Jackie uh, uh, you know, earlier about the, the sort of the serial failure of clinical trials, and I think there are many reasons for it, but one of, of the reasons, I think, is because so often we build clinical trials on science that's quite shaky to start with. So they fail, but the science is shaky because we have picked the wrong targets, weak targets that are not really relevant and central in, you know, to the disorder. So for us, it was very important because that's the thing that I do, right? So I had to keep you know, my end of the bargain strong, was to really come up with experiments that ask you know, not only are these mechanisms really central to the deficit in animal models, but are there parallels with human mechanisms of learning and memory? Now, this is independently of seeing if there, is, if there are treatments that can be given to humans. This is just about asking about parallels between the biology of mice, in this case, and humans, right? So I think we need to do this if we are to be successful in changing the way we go about the running clinical trials. I think one of the first steps is to really strengthen both the biology and animal models, and second, the parallels and links and bridges you know, between these animal models and human studies. So at some point, we decided to see if we could develop a treatment, and this is the work of Wei Dong Li and Steve Kunushner in the lab. They both are running, actually, big institutions, both of them. So this tells you how long this was. Uh, Wei Dong Li is, is head of research of a big hospital in, in, uh, in, uh, in Shanghai, and Steve Kushner is head of research for, the, for psychiatry in Rotterdam. But when they were in the lab, both of them worked together, and they essentially showed that statins, out of all things, can reverse the molecular, cellular, and behavioral deficits of NF1 mice. How can they do that? So this was Steve's idea. Again, I wish I could take credit for it, but I really can't. Uh, this was not my idea. If anything, in the beginning, I didn't think this was gonna work. But I just had the good sense of not saying that very loudly. So <laughs> and let Steve run with it. Uh, and why did Steve thought of it? So in order for RAS to be active, it needs this little lipid group that allows it to be in the membrane. If RAS is not near the membrane, might as well not be in the cell. So uh, Steve's idea was if we decrease the levels of isoprenylated RAS, RAS with this little you know, lipid group, then we would counteract the loss of, of NF1. Why didn't I think this would work? I said, look, Steve, 20% of all proteins in the body are isoprenylated. If 
statins manage to decrease the levels of isoprenylation in these proteins, then statins will be the most powerful toxin ever known to mankind. So in my heart, I thought this is not going to work. Uh, and amazingly, what uh, Stephen Wendong showed, and this was a huge surprise to me, is that uh, at uh, concentrations of statins that reverse the molecular abnormalities of the mutants, the plasticity deficits, and the learning impairments, at a dose that does all of that, that same dose does not touch the, the, the molecular signaling, the plasticity, or the learning of the, of the controls. It's really beautiful how this works. I mean, the, you know, the brain is very nonlinear, and you know, I keep forgetting that, that there's this nonlinearity in the brain that we can take advantage of and weave treatments under conditions that otherwise should have very uh, you know, negative impact. Because, you, I mean, think about it. What about all those other proteins that need to be isoprenylated, right? So statins are decreasing the levels of these isoprenols because that's what they do. They are precursors to cholesterol. That's what they were designed you know, to do. And that way, affect isoprenylation. What I didn't expect is that they would affect more proteins that are unusually highly isoprenylated you know, than others in general, which is really counterintuitive that I never imagined that it would, it would be that way. But the, what, what I do know, I don't know how really, this is only a guess what I shared with you. What I do know is that at the levels that you reverse the molecular, plasticity and learning impairments, you don't touch wild type animals at all. You know, you don't touch the signaling, the plasticity, and the learning of wild type animals. So, um, so that was quite fortuitous, and that led to clinical trials. Okay, before I share with you what's going on uh, uh, with all the clinical trials, let me give you some more evidence that perhaps, just perhaps, some of the mechanisms that we studied in mice may be relevant in humans too. So um, this is a paper not from our lab. Uh, uh, this is a paper that used TMS, you know, to look at inhibition and, uh, and, and, and to look at plasticity and attention. So how did they look at inhibition? Remember, in the NF1 mice, there is increased inhibition, which leads to deficits in synaptic plasticity and learning. So what they have done is to use, you know, TMS. You know about TMS, right? So you use uh, a, a pulse, a magnetic pulse, in order to activate uh, uh, neurons in a restricted area that's controlled by manipulating this coil that you place on the heads of, of patients. And uh, so the idea is that you, you can do a dose response curve with magnetic intensity. So you, you choose a pulse that is right below the pulse that's needed you know, to move the abductus pollicis brevis, which is one of your hand muscles, okay? So you, and then what you do is that you use that pulse plus one pulse that normally will activate that muscle. And the idea is that the first pulse triggers inhibition, and by the time the second pulse comes around, if you trigger enough inhibition, you inhibit the second pulse. Okay, so it's an indirect way of looking at inhibition. People have, have used it multiple times. I can hardly parrot this work, to be honest with you. I don't understand it. But, you know, I trust my colleagues that use it all the time. It's a way of looking at inhibition. And the amazing thing is that the NF anim, uh, the, uh, the NF patients have enhancements in this inhibition. You see how the inhibition is bigger? There's 60% inhibition. Uh, I mean, uh, the, the second pulse is 60% of what it should be instead of 80%, so there's a clear deficit. And lovastatin, the treatment that rescue the deficits in mice, also rescues the deficits in inhibition, okay, which is really cool. Now, what they did then is to look at LTP, and in this case, their form of plasticity, quote unquote LTP, uh, is the following. So what they do is that they give a series of pairs. So they actually pair you know, stimulation of, uh, of a nerve that goes to the motor cortex uh, on your wrist with uh, magnetic stimulation right on top of your motor cortex. And when they pair both, they induce a potentiation that I'll show you in a second. And the amazing thing is that they can see that potentiation in controls, but not in NF, just like in mice. In mice, we have a clear deficit in, in, uh, in potentiation, in LTP. And what they have shown here is a phenomena that's reminiscent of that. So let me share you, with you what that looks like. So here is the deficit. So you see this potentiation after you pair the, the activation of this nerve with, with motor cortex. You get this potentiation, and you, you see a failure in NF1, 
and the drug lovastatin rescues that. And the interesting thing is that these subjects only took lovastatin for four days, that's it. So they started it just like the mice. The mice take it for three or four days, and then you test them. That's it. That's what they have done here. And this, by the way, it's important, I think. I don't know for sure, but I think it's important. The time and doses, all of these things are important. So this is what uh, was done here. There were other trials that, you know, some of them were not very good. They were not double-blind, placebo-controlled. What I showed you before, these experimental measures, they were double-blind, you know, placebo-controlled. You know, but this, for example, wasn't, you know, this was just a let's look and see safety trial that they have also did some efficacy and they got some signals there, but since it was not placebo, double blind, who knows what that means? You know, because as, as you know, there's a huge placebo effect on anything you run, right? So, uh, but anyway, but here there's again another positive signal. Uh, this was an imaging trial uh, with the resting state imaging. So there are resting state patterns in an F1 that are abnormal and lovastatin rescues them. So what does this mean? Lots of signals. You know, they're not what we want. What we want is a drug that treats the patients, that essentially the kids now have normal social interaction, the kids now learn normally in school, the parents report a clear difference. This is what we want. What I would argue is that normally it's a really bad idea to go from working mice that's suggestive to make a big jump into the final thing that you want to see. Because that's why we keep on failing. And I think we keep eroding the confidence that the patients have on us. I think we need to do less trials, but do them better. This is what I, my own personal opinionated opinion. <laughs> and I don't know how much to give credit to my own opinion, because quite frankly, I'm not on the clinical trial world. But seeing it from this perspective, I think what we need you know, to do is to take more careful steps, more sure steps, start with biology that we understand, take, make an effort to look into humans for echoes of that biology, strong echoes of that biology, do a lot of clinical experimental work, and then go for the things that really make a difference in the life of the patients. I think by skipping steps in between, we are just uh, eroding the whole process. And I don't think it's serving us well because we keep on failing. So uh, anyway, my own very biased opinion is that I think uh, we're going about it wrong, and I think we need to change the way we go about this. All right, so is lovastatin effective or not? Frankly, I don't know. Uh, we have run a small trial, double-blind placebo control imaging trial at UCLA. We are about to fully analyze it. We have some hints that are very promising, both imaging and some of the measures that, that we have, but we really don't know because we haven't done full analysis on, on this trial. There's another trial that the Army ran, actually. This is the best version of pork barrel. You know, if you ever, you know, complain about pork barrel, at least this is one case where pork barrel was a good thing. You know, the, the, uh, where, uh, you know, Congress uh, has been investing about 10 to 15 million dollars a year on an F1, and in the last uh, eight years, they decided that some of that money should go to a Lovastatin trial, a multi-center international trial, which started with about 300 subjects, ended up with about half of them because of, you know, different reasons. And we will know, you know, very soon. So we have about 150 that are at the, at the very end of this. And, and we'll know very soon whether that works or not. So uh, the other thing is that there have been simvastatin trials which have been ineffective. Simvastatin goes through the blood-brain far better than lovastatin. And uh, in Europe, these trials used, you know, simvastatin because they couldn't use lovastatin. What's interesting is that in a paper that we published in Nature in 2000, what we showed is that too much RAS or too little RAS is equally bad. So there is this balance that you need to strike in, in, in the nervous system, you know, to have optimal plasticity in learning. So my guess, which is only a guess because we have never tested this, is that perhaps the simvastatin trials, because they were much longer, the, the big trial that was run, actually was run by a postdoc that, of mine that uh, uh, got an independent job and is doing incredibly well, Ipel Gersma uh, in Rotterdam. And uh, Ipa was able to take advantage of the, the Dutch healthcare system, which is amazing. And he was able to run a trial very cheaply because he took advantage of the regular visits that these patients have in the Netherlands anyway. And uh, so this trial, this trial was utterly negative, but the patients went on, on it for a very long time, very high doses. My guess is that uh, uh, it may have gone all too much on the other side, but this is things that we can actually test.
and uh, I know that IPA is working very hard to understand in, you know, what happened in this trial and, and what can you do you know, to, to, to improve it. So there's some signals that are promising, some signals that are negative, but again, these are two different drugs. All our work was done on lovastatin, not on simvastatin. So at this point, we still don't know whether all of this is going to end up by helping patients or not. But along the way, we are learning something about the process, which I think is, is really important. In the, last, uh, in the last 10 or 15 minutes that I've left, I will tell you about another study that we've done in the lab. And now, from now on, all the results are unpublished. So I will show you the data. So uh, up to now, everything has been published. So that's why I didn't uh, you know, bother showing all that data, because you can look it up. And this is on Noonan syndrome, which is another very interesting f uh, uh, disorder. Uh, both Noonan and NF1 have, have very high rates of autism. So in, in both disorders, about 20 30% of the kids have autism. And we really don't understand this. Uh, uh, the strategy in our lab has been to let's understand something in these disorders in detail, something that we can leverage our tools and, and an extensive you know, behavioral neuroscience uh, that's, that, you know, that's available. Let's understand that and then leverage what we find to understand things like autism, which is really what we're doing now. And uh, as you know, uh, with autism, there are very frequent co uh, uh, comorbidities in intellectual disability. You know, the two often come together. And uh, not always, of course, but they often do come together. So we thought, let's try to figure out what NUN and NNF1 do in detail in terms of, of cognitive function, and then leverage that to understand what's happening in, uh, in autism. And that's what we are actually doing now. So let me share with you what we have done in terms of cognitive function. This was the work of Yang Sakli. I have had the good fortune of working with people that make me look good. And one of them you know, you know, Brian is in your faculty here. And Brian is one of the uh, stars that came out of my lab and has done incredibly well. Uh, Yang Sakli is another star that has his own lab now and is doing very well. When he was in the lab, he uh, initiated and carried out many of the studies that I'm about you know, to share with you on, on Noonan syndrome. So, uh, what I will show you is that unlike NF1, where there's increase in Rosmap kinase signaling, an increase in GABA release, deficits in plasticity in learning, in Noonan, there's an increase in Rosmap kinase signaling, the same as NF1, but in another cell type, not in inhibitory neurons, but in excitatory neurons. And that leads to a basal level increase in AMPA receptors, which then precludes or occludes LTP. Okay, so very different LTP and learning phenotypes, but and very and very similar. Uh, I'm sorry, very similar LTP and learning phenotypes, very similar signaling phenotypes, but very different cell biology. And you may think, wait a second, so why these differences? The reason is that genes come in clusters in families, and sometimes you get rid of one, there's compensation in one cell type, but the compensation is not as effective in another cell type. And then you get differences in phenotypes because of the mutation, but also because of this other compensatory machinery that, that's all embedded in us. Uh, one of the studies that I've heard recently that really fascinated me, I don't know if this will be reproduced, but it seems to be a, a really interesting study, is the idea that you, when you look at autistic families and look at the severity of autism in families, you can predict the severity by looking at unaffected individuals in those families, by looking at the severity of problems, social problems, all the things that you see in autism, you can look in families, in unaffected individuals, and by the degree of severity, well, not severity because they are not diagnosed, but by the, de the degree of deficits, you can predict the deficits in the family. So what does this mean? It means that in addition to single mutations, there is a barrage of other genetic mutations that may be predisposing and may be exacerbating and conditioning how single genetic mutations then affect uh, this uh, other uh, you know, main phenotype. And I think something like that may be going on in these distinctions that I'm about to share with you. Okay, so Noonan syndrome, uh, there's a number of abnormalities. This is not just cognitive function, inner structural abnormalities, congenital heart problems. Essentially, the heart problems are shared with NF12, uh, 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 cerebrovascular abnormalities, short stature, delayed puberty. Anyway, it's not just cognitive function. That's true with NF1. It's true of all the Mendelian disorders. But, of course, we study them because of cognitive problems. The learning disability is very common. Just like NF1, they affect more than a third of all individuals. Uh, there's a broad range of cognitive deficits, just like NF1. Uh, clumsiness, motor coordination, 
like an F1, it's very common. Uh, social, emotional recognition, expression problems, very common in Noonan, just like with an F1. Affects one in two to 3,000 people, which is not unlike an F1 itself, okay? But clearly very different genes. One thing that's different is that an F1 is mostly caused by two genes, spread one and an F1. Uh, but in the case of uh, Noonan syndrome, there's actually a number of mutations that have been found that associated with Noonan. The nice thing is that you know, mutations in PTPN11 account for more than 50% of these patients. So we decided to study those mutations, but there are others. We have actually made mutations in RAF, in KRAS. We have studied mutations in RAF, in KRAS, but, and NRAS, but now we are, we are going to focus our, our, the, uh, what I'll share with you on mutations on, on this gene, which uh, I'll talk about in a second. Okay, so um, these are gain-of-function mutations and uh, they result in enhanced ROSMAP kinase signaling. How these mutations result in enhanced ROSMAP kinase signaling, I am ashamed to share with you that we fully do not understand this yet. You know, we don't understand how the tyrosine phosphatase is regulating RAS function in detail. What we do know is that it does regulate RAS function because uh, what we find in both, in several tissues in humans and certainly in mice, is clearly enhancements in ROSMAP kinase signaling. Now, what Young Sak decided to do is to study two different mutations, a strong mutation with severe phenotype and a weak mutation with weak phenotype. Now, this is severe and weak in patients. And what I will show you is that there is a variety of phenotypes, and the amazing thing is that what's severe in humans is severe in mice, what's weak in humans is weak in mice. So we have that, that parallel, which is really nice you know, to show. So two mutations, the D61G and 308D, you know, mutation, both of which we studied in mice. So we, we started by looking at uh, hippocampal function. Why hippocampal function? Because this gene is highly expressed in the hippocampus and we have, uh, ex uh, we have expertise in it. And what we found is that there are clear uh, learning and memory deficits. Uh, I will sh won't have time to show you all the data. Uh, as you can see in acquisition of the water maze, these animals, uh, just flatten out. In probe trials, they don't discriminate between the targeting quadrant and other quadrants very well. When you look at proximity, the wild types look near the platform than the mutants. So they're clear uh, deficits in the water maze. It turns out that these deficits are compounded by some motor problems. But anyway, there's clear deficits uh, in the strong mutant. In the weak mutant, you see deficits, but they're not nearly as profound, okay? so. Strong in humans, strong in mice, weak in humans, weak in mice. You see the proximity deficits, you see a difference between you know, target searches, but it's clearly a much more subtle mutation. So subtle in, in humans, subtle in mice, strong in humans, strong in mice. Then what we have done is to look at another task. You see the same thing, the deficit there yet. You see the distribution, that's why it's subtle. But anyway, once again, this is the weak mutant on another behavioral task, the same thing. We have done this in a few behavioral tasks uh, and we get very similar results. Now, we looked at plasticity because knowing that there is a prominent hippocampal deficit, we now know that stable long-lasting changes in synaptic function are a critical part of, of learning and memory. So we wanted to ask whether we saw evidence for deficits in long-term synaptic plasticity. And we looked in CA1, why CA1? Because in the tasks that we have run, we know that there are very, uh, very prominent deficits caused by changes in CA1 specifically. That if you, for example, change in the versions of the tasks that we ran, CA3 or dendrite gyres, the, the, the effects are far more subtle. So we decided to look at, at CA1 because of that, and there are very prominent plasticity deficits in the strong mutant, and these deficits are present on the weak mutant, but, uh, uh, well, and when we look at other forms of presynaptic plasticity, they're not as, you know, the, the effects are subtle, but when we look at the weak mutant, again, strong mutant, big deficits, weak mutants, small deficits. So now we have behavioral deficits. We have two mutants, strong and weak, with strong and weak behavioral deficits. And now we have you know, physiology deficits that make sense from what we know about th that type of learning. And we also have strong and weak deficits, okay? So that's essentially what this shows. And this is just other forms of plasticity that are nearly as affected, okay? Uh, now, one of the key questions when you come to this stage, is this development or is this adult mechanisms, right? Because it could be just development. 
the Ross signaling pathway has a critical role in neurotrophic function. This could all be about brain malformation. So what we decided to do is to engineer a viral vector that we could go into adults, and we could go only into pyramidal neurons of the adults, which is the region that we think, we thought, was critically involved in deficits that the patients and the mice show. So we decided to manipulate only that region and only in adults, right? Because then we would know one way or the other whether that, uh, that region is critical for the deficits that we talked about. And uh, so what we have done is to develop an AV5 viral vector, place it into the, into the pyramidal fields of the hippocampus, CA1 and CA3. You can see what I mean by CA1 and CA3. It's not really in the dentate gyrus as far as, as we can tell. And then uh, we look to make sure that there were increases in SHIP2 levels, right? Remember, these are mutant levels, the D61G. That's what we engineered in the virus. So we got that, so that worked very well. Then what we did was to look at the impact of this on ROSMAP kinase signaling. And what we found is that at basal levels, there was increase in the mutants and then, uh, in, ROS, uh, in ROS GTP and increases in phosphomap kinase. So that signaling pathway at basal levels was increased by the mutation, by that dominant active mutation that we engineered and placed uh, specifically in the adult uh, pyramidal hippocampus. So then we ask, if you get rid of all developmental deficits, can you still see deficits in mechanisms of memory? So we looked at uh, long-term potentiation, and there were clear deficits. So although we only affected about one in two neurons, uh, maybe a little bit better than that, nevertheless, that was strong enough for us to see clear plasticity deficits, and this is target only at, at adults. Okay? Because remember, the treatments, we're not going to fix what happened during development, right? So if we can't find unambiguous evidence that what we are measuring is specifically due to adult mechanisms, then what are we doing other than fooling ourselves? Essentially, that's the way I, I see it. So, uh, so indeed, that's you know, clear that you see these you know, physiological deficits. And then we looked at, uh, at uh, learning. And uh, let me call your attention to this here, because this tells actually, uh, I should have done the same thing for all the other uh, uh, experiments. I just didn't make the slides the same way. So as you can see, if you collapse all the searches in the water maze, so the animals are searching for the platform. We have removed it from the pool. Now they are searching. And as you can see, the wild type search right on top of the platform. You see the red here? Means that there's a lot of pixels that were crossed by the mice in that area. But look at the mutants. It's yellowish. It's distributed. And they seem to do what animals often do when they don't know what they're doing, which is they en end up by hanging around one part of the pool because it's close to the door. I don't know. The reason why they hang around that, I really don't know. But often, you know, they do things like this. And, uh, but the key is that they're not looking in the right place of the pool, OK? So there's a clear deficit. Again, this is only adult hippocampus. And uh, the proximity tells you exactly the same story. Uh, so this here uh, is just showing that if you overexpress the protein, but this is not the mutant protein now. So what we have done as a control is to take the viral vector and overexpress the wild type protein. Because we wanted to know whether we'll get the same effects. Maybe this has nothing to do with the mutation. You're just overexpressing the protein, and therefore the mechanisms are not really what you look for in a patient. Because in a patient, you get the mutation, not the overexpression of the protein. Right? So when we overexpress the protein, there is no impact on either, uh, in, on either uh, you know, you see the overexpression of the protein is clear here. Right? You see this big overexpression, uh, and you see it here in Westerns, but there's no learning deficit whatsoever. So it's not enough to overexpress the normal protein. You have to overexpress the mutant protein. So that's critical. So next, what we decided to do is to look at mechanism. So what is the mechanism of this? So we know there's something to do with Rajmap kinase signaling. You know that there's something to do with the plasticity, but we don't really know how this is taking place. So that's what I'll share with you next. Because again, I think mechanism is important as we get ready to go on the long road of taking this into the clinic. So um, what I will share with you is that there is increased basal levels of Rosmap kinase signaling, enhanced, enhanced basal levels of GluA1 receptors, AMPA receptors, enhanced basal levels of synaptic transmission, occlusion of LTP, which then lead to spatial and contextual deficits. So that's what I'm about to share with you. Okay. First, uh, the occlusion of increases in Rosmap kinase. So if you train an animal or if you induce LTP, it works on both cases. What you see is an increase in the levels 
of MAP kinase signaling. I already showed you increase in the levels of RAGTP2, right? So this is increases in the levels of, of MAP kinase signaling. But you don't see these increases in the mutants, which is really interesting. So the mutants have an increased basal level, a significant increase in basal level, but that increase doesn't get any bigger when you train them, when you induce LTP. So what we think is going on is that usually the nervous system has a lot of silent synapses that you add AMPA receptors to and therefore potentiate synapses and then therefore store information. So one of the ways to get long-term potentiation is to move AMPA receptors into membranes and to increase AMPA currents. That's a mechanism that many people have worked on. And what we find is that at basal levels, these animals already have high levels of AMPA receptors. Many of their synapses are already populated by AMPA receptors. So when you want to potentiate them, we can't because it's already done. So if you want to learn something, you need to have a mechanism by which you change something, right? If you can't change something, you can't learn it. And I think that's one idea that we are pursuing. Let me show you some more evidence for that. So one of the things that we have looked is what about the function of these synapses? What's different about them? So think about it. Let's say that I'm right, which we have some evidence for it. Am I convinced? Well, at this point, perhaps, but let me share the evidence with you. Let's say that you already have a lot of AMPA receptors in, mem in membranes where normally you wouldn't have them. What would you expect to see? If you were to count the number of spontaneous events, uh, you know, synapses have spontaneous events. They, they're functioning in the back, around whether you stimulate them or not. And that's a way of looking at synaptic function. And you do that by looking at minis. So the idea was if there is more AMPA receptors postsynaptically, one of the expectations that you, you would uh, have is that you would see higher mini frequency because in those synapses where you're getting spontaneous events but there's no AMPA receptors, you wouldn't see a signal. But now that there are AMPA receptors, you should see a signal. And that's essentially what you get. You get an increase in mini frequency. Now, this by itself would not demonstrate anything because this could be explained by something entirely different. Like, for example, a greater frequency of release, right? So you can't tell from this experiment alone. Uh, this could just be greater release or could be that there are more synapses that are ready to receive the signal. One or the other will give you the same type of, of, of result. But again, this is consistent with that idea, and I'll show you more, that I think altogether it makes a case. When we looked at inhibition, because we really thought when we start study this, because the phenotypes are so similar, we thought this is going to be like an F1. We are going to see enhanced inhibition. When we look at inhibition, postsynaptic, presynaptic function, we found that inhibition is absolutely intact in, in these animals. We have looked at this multiple times with both the viral vectors and with the knockouts. It doesn't really matter. In both cases, inhibition is intact, which is what this figure summarizes. However, another expectation, if there is too many AMPA receptors before training, before LTP, we should see a shift in the ratio between NMDA receptors and AMPA receptors, right? Because these guys have more at basal level, so you should see a greater rate of AMPA receptor to NMDA receptors. That was another expectation, which is, again, met here. So once again, one more piece of evidence that's consistent with this general idea that uh, what we have is an amplification of synapses. Another thing that we did is to look directly with antibodies and ask, can, I, can we see evidence that there is indeed more AMPA receptor clusters? And essentially, uh, that's what this shows here, that indeed there is greater particle number, but no change in particle size, which is really interesting. So multiple methods telling you one story. Then we wanted to ask, what about mechanism? So if this is rasmap signaling, as we claim, then we should be able to act on these phenotypes by manipulating MAC signaling. MAC is upstream of MAP kinase. It's a critical part of rasmap kinase signaling. There's a very nice and very specific inhibitor. So what I will show you next is that this MAC inhibitor rescued the MAP kinase, the presynaptic LTP, and learning deficits in noon and mutant mice. So let me go through this relatively quickly. This is showing that we can rescue this mini frequency uh, result that I showed you. So the MAC inhibitor can rescue. So this result is really due to Rasmab kinase signaling as we hypothesized. We can rescue the LTP. You can see it clearly here. We can rescue, and this is the most remarkable thing, we can rescue the learning deficit. So focus, because we don't have a lot of time, just focus your attention here. So you see the, the, you know, the GFP controls that are doing very well, as you may imagine. This level of MAC inhibitor does not affect the controls. So we always use a level of the drug that does not affect the, uh, the controls. 
That's critical in all of our experiments. The level of the drug that does not affect the, uh, the controls, you know, completely rescued the mutants. Look at these two. You see there's no red here? And look at this, lots of red. And you can see it in all, you see how this is random? And now these guys are searching selectively, more selectively in the training quadrant. And you see it here too. This is Everest, you know, proximity. You see how these guys stick up, showing that they're searching far away from the pool and how the drug rescues them? It's really remarkable. I have seen this multiple times. We start becoming blasé when we look at these results. But it's truly amazing that this actually works this way. So this is quite a complex behavior, what the animals are learning here, and, and we can rescue them. So, uh, and what's more, and I'll finish with this, is to show you that statins, because they work on the same pathway, we, we can also rescue the signaling deficits, we can rescue the LTP deficits, and more importantly, we can rescue the behavioral deficits. See, once again, the deficit of the mutants, you see, it's very clear, and we can rescue them uh, with the with the statins. See, look at the difference between this search where these guys are searching the target quadrant, the wild types are searching, the wild types of statins are also searching, not the mutants, but when you give them statins, they look like this. It's truly remarkable because we give them starting f three days before training, that's it. And then during training, which is another week essentially, and we get this remarkable rescue uh, in mice. So. Uh, I have shown you that in NF1 there's an increase in GABA release, in Noonan there's increasing in receptors, and I have one more summary thing to show you. I don't have time to show you the data. I'm running over already, one minute over, and I apologize for that. I'm about to finish. So we, we, um, we wanted to know whether timing of Rosmap kinase increase in an excitatory neurons is important. And what I will sh share with you is uh, a couple of manipulations, Raji 12V, which you published, and CCR5, which you have not published. And the remarkable thing about these two mutants, they are two separate mutations, and I don't have time to share them with you, unfortunately, you know, the details. But these two mutations, at basal levels, they have normal levels of Rosmap kinase signaling. But once we trigger LTPO learning, then we get a bigger signal out of them. So there's an enhancement in Rosmap kinase signaling following learning, following LTP. Okay, not at basal levels, but falling learning and falling LTP. And these guys have an increase in amper receptor function following learning or following LTP and a dramatic enhancement in both LTP and learning and memory. So now we have four, you know, th at least, you know, three different situations. If you enhance Rosmap kinase signaling inhibitory neurons, you get deficits. If you enhance it in excitatory neurons before training, if the signaling pathway is such that you just have this increased basal level, big deficits in learning, in excitatory neurons. But if you leave those increases because of, of regulatory uh, you know, machinery that we only partially understand for after LTP in learning, then you get dramatic enhancements. So this just gives you a flavor for what we have to overcome, right? One signaling pathway, multiple effects in multiple cell types, and multiple effects in time. So if you increase Rosmap kinase signaling before learning, big deficit. If you increase it after learning, big enhancements in learning and memory. This is what we have to overcome, right, as we develop treatments for these disorders. And I thought that this was fun sharing with you, and I just want to finish by, sh uh, by uh, mentioning some of the people that were critical in these studies. Young Suckley, I mentioned, Dan Enninger, which actually started the Noonan syndrome studies in the lab, Mio Jo, Christina Nan, Balai, uh, uh, Balajia Prakash, Aida, Aida Yamin, actually Brian helped quite a lot on these studies when he was in the lab. He was a, our go-to expert. Anytime we had a question about behavior, we'll go to Brian. <laughs> so uh, his name should be up here, although he didn't do directly anything on Noonan syndrome itself as far as I know. Uh, he was the go-to guy when we had a problem w w with behavior. And then a number of people that have helped us, uh, 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 Corina Berger with some of the viral vectors. She taught us how to make viral vectors in the lab and now it's wonderful to be able to just make any vector we want. We, we do it in our lab. Uh, Benjamin Neal that shared some of the mutants with us and Yonkyu Kim's lab that helped us with some of the amper receptor antibody culture studies that I shared with you. Uh, so thank you so much. It's been a pleasure being here and I'm looking forward to my day tomorrow. Thank you. Thanks a lot for this great presentation. A uh, couple of questions on NF1. First question, uh, what's the cause of the comorbidity with autism? Is it the position of the mutation or is it genetic background? And sec second question, if you just follow up here. Um, 
so the fact that uh, GABA signaling is uh, apparently affected in NF1, uh, does, in your opinion, lend further support to the excitation inhibition imbalance hypothesis in autism? Uh, is there something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so let me address that. So why, why only 20% of NF1 patients with autism? Why only 40% uh, patients with autism in TSC? You know, I mean, we see this in all the syndromes. Why partial penetrance? Our lab has worked a tiny bit, and I am even reluctant to talk about this because there are real experts in, in this campus on this. I think one of the factors is environmental factors, absolutely. Um, I, I think neuroinflammation is one of the factors. We know that in tuberous sclerosis, because we have done studies with tuberous sclerosis, where uh, if we activate you know, the immune system during pregnancy in mice, we can get social phenotypes in the tuberous sclerosis mice, but we cannot get them if we don't activate you know, the immune system. And then we looked in human subjects, and we found that this is all published. That's why I didn't mention it. So when we look in human subjects, we find that depending on when you were born, the probability of getting autism is different. And that's relevant to the fact that during the year, the big bolus of infection is flu. You know? So you have this uh, 20 to 30% increase in the probability of getting autism if you, if you were born when your third trimester was around you know, flu season. So when you have the mouse work and the human work, the hypothesis becomes credible that uh, activating the immune system during gestation has an impact in tubal sclerosis. We knew that it has an impact in general for, from the work of, of many people, some of, of them in this campus, including you know, Paul Patterson and others. But now we know that in terms of tubal sclerosis, there's clear an impact in mice, and there may be an impact in people too. So I'll imagine, because the rasmap kinase pathway feeds into the mTOR signaling pathway, which tuberous sclerosis affects, I'll imagine that probably there is an effect like that in NF1 too, and we are in the process of testing it. You know? So in terms of, of your second question of excitation inhibition balance, I think that that hypothesis has so much you know, credibility now. Uh, we find this again and again. So I, I think it's, uh, it's, it's an hypothesis that it's worth taking seriously. And I spoke with Randy, and Randy told me about you know, really beautiful uh, uh, trials that she's planning and she's in the process of doing that take advantage of manipulating this balance. So I, I think we'll see more and more of this, especially for idiopathic autism, which we don't really have a gene to hang our hands on and clear mechanisms. You know, maybe if we find general mechanisms, we may be able to leverage them to uh, you know, give it a try uh, in general autism, which is it's always, always problematic because we already know there's probably many disorders under many different types of clusters and umbrellas. But I think that you know, there may be cores of mechanisms that we could leverage in these general trials. So I, I, I completely uh, agree with the, with the implications of your questions. I, I think it's, it's, it's very promising. Would the Roche drug that's an alpha, uh, a GABA-A, alpha-5 inverse um, uh, agonist or an antagonist, do you think it might be helpful for MS? Actually, we tested that. Yes, we did. And uh, it improved cognitive function in F1 mice. It, you know, it was a very clear effect. Ooh. So, so we tested that. It's unpublished. We should probably eventually publish it. We never bothered to publish it, but we should probably do it. But anyway, yeah. Yeah, we have had that result for a while, actually, in the lab. I, yeah, anyway, yeah. But it was, it was quite a bit of mice that we did. By the way, incidentally, we saw enhancements in wild type 2. <laughs> so we see enhancements in wild type and mutants. That's one of the reasons we didn't publish it, because it's a general phenomena. And we already knew that GABA alpha drugs have an impact on cognitive function. Others had shown that with other inhibitors, not the Roche inhibitor. And even with mutant mice, actually, with alpha-5. So that's why we didn't rush, rush to publish this, because you know, we didn't think it was that so surprising. Was that but GABA, yes, it, so I imagine because that. they asked us to look in NF1, and we showed an increase in NF1, mice, mice. And, uh, and then uh, you know, the, the, uh, the statin trials were in the way, and I guess the idea was, let's see what statin trials do before we start something big with NF1 again. Um, but uh, yeah. Anyway. Yes, I was going to ask that same question. Is there an advantage to going further uh, upstream, down, downstream to the RAS mechanisms versus staying at the synaptic neurotransmitter level yeah. with the GABA, GABA antagonist for Noonan or an AMPA drug for? OK, I, I'm, I'm going to say something crazy about that, that, uh, you know, that I, I uh, I'm, you know, again, this is outside of my field of expertise, so this is not worth much, but let me say it anyway, which is the following. Uh, the sort of the paradigm right now has been find a target, find something that's highly specific to that target, that manipulates it really surgically, 
and go for it. My feeling now is that that may not be such a good idea. And, and, and let me tell you why. That's why I mean this is a crazy thing to say, but okay, but let me tell you why. The reason is that uh, very often it's very hard to weave a fine line between treating and killing, you know? I mean, being at the, you, know, you know, the two extremes, right? And uh, epilepsy and all sorts of other things. With alpha-5 is not a problem, I understand that. But you know, anytime you manipulate function in a very surgical, specific manner, there's always a price to be paid because you want to improve function. These systems, we're not in those, and so on and so forth. So what the statins taught me is something magical that I didn't know about, that you, it's possible to devise treatments which do not affect function that's normal, but affect function when it's disrupted. And you may be wondering, what is this guy talking about? He lost it already. What do you mean? How does the drug know to affect what's abnormal but not affect what's normal, right? Because that's essentially what I'm saying. And I think, personally, one of the problems that I have is that I always think of the brain as linear, meaning you, it's like a Newtonian, highly wired system where you push one thing, the other thing happens in a predictable, linear manner. But if we know something about the brain, is that it does not work like a Newtonian machine at all. But it's hard for us to live back, at least for me. I work in a very mechanistic, you know, very reductionist lab, and we can't help it, keep these Newtonian wheel-turning wheel models. <laughs> but the brain does not work like that. So it may be possible to devise drugs like statins. I mean, think about it. All Again, I, let me repeat that there, because I find it so magical, that at the dose of statins that reverse like 30 to 40 percent increases in ROS GTP, in phosphomep kinase, deficits in LTP, and deficits in learning. At the same dose, we did not move the ROS, MEP kinase, LTP, and learning of the wild types, not even a little bit. I mean, this is remarkable. So I think it's those types of drugs that we need to look for instead of these magic bullets. I think we should just give up these magic bullets and find these drugs that are attuned to the homeostatic principles of the brain, because that's at the end of the day, that's what's going on. There is homeostasis in the brain at the molecular level, at the cellular level, at the systems level, at even a hyper-systems level, you know, between different memory and, and cognitive systems in the brain. There's homeostasis all over the place, and we need to leverage this homeostasis instead of fighting it. I think these surgical methods where you have something that's very specific, targeting one molecule, in a way that's fighting this homeostatic system, you know? And I think we need to leverage it as we develop treatments. And we just absolutely randomly stumbled on this with statins. Now, talking with my cl clinical, you know, uh, you know, colleagues, they say, of course, we know lots of examples like that. You know, this is nothing new. But from a mechanistic perspective, we don't understand these effects. And we need to understand them so we can leverage them. From a clinical, pharmacological perspective, this is an old news. Of course, there's drugs that affect uh, individuals uh, that have problems, but they don't uh, have effects on normals. We have known this forever. Why is this such a big thing? It's not a big thing, but what, what's a big thing is that we have never really understood that at a molecular and cellular level, so we can leverage it to specifically develop drugs like that, that have those properties. You know, that you don't affect, you don't mock with systems when they are functioning within normal, homeostatic levels, but, they, but you do when they are not, and push them back into this homeostatic range that you know, the nervous system can function well. I mean, think about it. The study that we showed where too much RAS, too little RAS, we get deficits. But what we have done, and I didn't share with you, is that we had this K-RAS mutation, which has big impairments in learning and memory. And then we have the NF1 mutation, which also has impairments in learning and memory. We put the two mutations together, and the animals are absolutely normal. How could you get that if there wasn't strong homeostasis in the brain? And then you say, well, maybe we just got lucky. So now we did the same thing with NRAS, with both an homozygote and heterozygote mutation. This is all published in Nature in early 2000. So think about it. Three very different uh, levels of decrease in RAS activity, all of which completely rescued the, you know, the NF1 mutation. How could you do that if you're not leveraging homeostasis? So that's what we need you know, to do in terms of drug development. Give up these magic bullets. They don't work. We know that. So let's focus on, on something else. Sorry, long-winded answer. Okay. <laughs> so let, let me just ask a question, though. I, you went real quickly through the um, electrophysiology on the um, AMPIS system. Um, did you say that the, the, the mini frequency was actually reduced? Because we normally think about mini frequency in terms of a presynaptic That's uh, right. Effect. So let me explain that. So I tried to, 
to explain it, but I realized that I had spent too much time on NF1, and then I went a bit too fast for the unpublished data. So, okay, let me repeat that. So the classical view, let's say you know nothing about the synapse or some sort of manipulation, and you look at mini frequency. What is mini? for those of you that are not synaptic physiologists, because I know that there's a lot of mixed audience here, okay? So minis is the following. There are two types, at least two types of synaptic release. There's more, but there is two types. One where you activate the, you know, the synapse and you trigger calcium and then there is release of vesicles. That's one. Another where you don't do any of that and you just listen to these synapses. And spontaneously, at certain frequency that depends on conditions, you get these small events that are supposedly due to vesicles you know, releasing neurotransmitter into the synapse. And, uh, and then being heard on the other side by receptors that are activated that you can record responses. Now, if you know nothing else about synapses and all you get is an increase in mini frequency, then the, the simplest in interpretation, Aiken's razor, everybody heard of Aiken's razor, Aiken's razor will tell you that this is a presynaptic problem, that there is greater synaptic release, there's more of these events. Now, just because this is the simplest explanation, it's not always the only explanation because it depends what else you know. So in this case, we have several other pieces of evidence that point towards the postsynaptic side and none that point towards the presynaptic side. So what other pieces of evidence point to the postsynaptic side? You should get an increase in many amplitude if it's postsynaptic. Uh, well, it depends. It depends of how you measure it. So if you're looking at these small spontaneous events, then you would only get a, a change in mini amplitude if for the synapses that are potentiated already or that have amper receptors already, you will get more amper receptors. But we showed with antibodies that what you see is more amper clusters, but less, not increase less, less in Less silent synapses, but not more per synapse. Yeah, exactly, gotcha. that's exactly right. And when you look at the ratios, it's consistent with that. So if you put all of this data together, the simplest explanation is that you have more synapses that are already occupied by amper receptors, so you record more of these spontaneous events that otherwise you wouldn't, because you wouldn't even have amper receptors to let you know that you just had a, a you know, release event. So now, do we know this with absolute confidence? No, all we have is three different pieces of evidence that all converge on this explanation, and we are continuing to study this. I think it's enough for us to give it some credibility, especially because we found increases in ras -MAP kinase signaling at basal levels, and we know that MAP kinase signaling pathway is needed for amplification of, of, of synapses. So we already have previous studies involving this pathway on amplification of synapses. We have higher levels of this pathway being active, and we have more evidence for more amper receptors. So now we have at least four different lines of evidence, all of which converge on this simple explanation. So, so that, yeah. that, would, that would predict then that LTP would be occluded. Maybe you should. And it is, that. and yeah. it is. So then we look at LTP, what we find that it's occluded. Uh, so I think, and, and of course we did this not just in one system, but in two different systems. We did this with uh, the, the knockouts, the germline knockouts, and then we did this by adding uh, you know, the mutation to excitatory neurons uh, in, the, in, in CA1 and CA3. We didn't restrict them to, to CA1 only, actually. We target CA1, but for, because of the neuroanatomy of, of the hippocampus, a lot of the virus went into CA3 and the nature of AAV5, and then we got uh, you know, CA3 too, but that's okay. Uh, what we found is that, once again, we repeated the same findings there too. And I think when you see something in two different systems and four different lines of evidence, it sort of gives you some uh, you know, uh, you know, convergent evidence that maybe this is the simplest ex explanation, you know, to all of this. But anyway, yeah. And my thinking has always been that if you have a genetic disorder, the pathology is beginning as soon as the gene is being expressed, and that what you'd really like to do is to see whether or not you could prevent or, re or, or determine if there are critical periods early in development when the drugs that you're developing might be useful. And so I'm wondering, you know, is, th is that a strategy we didn't hear about? Is that... Yes, you so okay, okay, let me say that you're absolutely right. So if in, in, in a perfect world, we should be able to detect when we see nascent problems and then prevent them with these treatments. You're absolutely completely right. But, I mean, think about the many millions of people that are in the world already that uh, our adult will live for another 60, 70 years, you know, some of them, with these disorders, it, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could do something about those people, independently of what you said, which is absolutely the goal. But there is yet another problem, which is, as you well know, and Randy, I, 
tell you a lot about this too, uh, that it's enormously difficult to get you know, clinical trials approved for very early interventions. I mean, it's difficult to get them approved for later interventions, never mind early interventions. So we thought that perhaps if we were to focus on this component of the problem, we could help all of these adult patients and at the same time have a patient population that we may, we may actually be able to intervene on. You know, because I think to uh, get IRB approval for you know, treating mothers with some of these drugs will be very difficult, you know, in, you know, pregnant mothers. Do we need to do that eventually? You are absolutely and, and completely uh, you know, right about that. So the other thing that we have done, and this is where some of the really interesting things, uh, and this is all very preliminary, but I'm amongst friends, I can share this for whatever it's worth, which is um, studies in Fragile X, for example, in flies, have shown that you can rescue the adult phenotypes of the flies by either intervening in development or in the adult. So there's a series of very beautiful studies that you can do both. And, uh, but again, this is flies. What we have shown in mice, uh, which is very interesting for another disorder that we studied that really surprised us. As a control experiment, we intervene in development, actually in postnatal development, and we were able to rescue adult phenotypes. So there's more to this than we know. But I think that for the next 10 years or so, uh, if we have a chance to make inroads into these problems, it will probably be in these sort of postnatal trials starting with kids about five, seven or so. Anything younger than that, it's gonna be trickier and trickier you know, to get approval. Am I right about so, that? So you always have to start in adults with the new med. You yeah. have to start with adults and then you have to show safety with adolescents and then you can go down to five. And then with a new med, but this is assuming that you are repurposing, which is what we're talking about here, taking drugs, because the game is completely different if you come up with a brand new drug. Then you are, I mean, oh, then you have real problems. <laughs> but, but at least but if you're repurposing. That has been given in the new world oh. for a variety of different uh, problems. That's right. But then it's, it's a question of convincing, you know, the IRB group that it's worth for this condition to intervene, you know, that early. Despite, I must tell you that even though I've used statins, my, if I collect all the information that I have on it, unfortunately there have been so very few studies done on statins and barrages of cognitive trials in, uh, in normals. But if I had to make a guess based on what's published is that uh, uh, the statins that go through the blood-brain barrier, right? Because there's two classes of statins. Statins that don't go to the brain because they, are not the, they don't have the right lipophilic you know, content and statins that do. My guess based on all that I know and, and actually the, the FDA agrees with this guess because they put a, uh, a note out uh, saying that you should be careful in, in 2012. My guess is that if you were to do very careful studies of statins that go through the blood-brain barrier, the ones that we need to act on the brain, uh, then those will probably cause clear cognitive deficits on a barrage of things. I think, although no one has looked at this carefully, but everything that I know from the little that's been done with rats and this, the indirect studies with, 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 uh, you know, with people is that we will probably not have a really hard time finding clear depth, especially if you treat for three, four, five months. You know, which is, I mean, what these trials have been actually, the, the simvastatin trial has been for nearly a year. So I think in these long-term, uh, um, you know, treatments with statins that go through the blood brain, I think there will be a price, you know, to be paid, even for normals. That's my, my gut feeling, I have no data on it. Uh, but I think these studies really need to be done because now statins are being used again and again, especially for brain problems, for Alzheimer's, for, uh, you know, problems with stroke. I mean, there's all sorts of indications for it, you know, because essentially it's affecting 20% of all the proteins in the brain. So it's not surprising that you'll find multiple indications for, the, you know, for the same drug because essentially it's having multiple targets. Um, so, but I, I think we need to be careful because I, I, I think when we study this carefully, we are going to see a significant price, you know, to be paid, uh, you know, from taking statins. So, you know, we need to be careful. The UC Davis Mind Institute was created in 1998 with the promise to find cures for neurodevelopmental disorders. Every day, our physicians and researchers come closer to fulfilling that promise. Their groundbreaking research on autism, Fragile X syndrome, chromosome 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, ADHD, and other brain disorders are helping children achieve their fullest potential. 
Please visit our website to find out more about current studies, upcoming events, and how you can help make a difference.